Corporus Lupercal, the War Master, had turned against the Emperor of Mankind. This supreme betrayal had brought the nascent Imperium into a state of utter chaos, heresy, outright civil war. Brother Astartes killed Brother Astartes. In the earliest days of the heresy, the traitors were not the corrupted nightmares that would be seen upon their ultimate arrival at Terra. For the heresy would take many years, and Horus would leave the galaxy burning in his wake as he travelled across the galaxy to return to the homeworld of humanity and to face the Emperor himself. As the early years of the heresy wore on, Horus had long felt the darkened whispers, the prompts and suggestions in his mind that were clearly not his own. His outward appearance was as composed, controlled and strong as ever, yet he felt the insidious whispers in his mind, penetrating questions, curiosities, realisations. Like most of the traitors, by the time the heresy broke out into the open, Horus was far beyond the point of return already, the clarity of their actions only further emboldened by the continual bolstering and assertions of the traitor Primarchs and Astartes to each other that this was unquestionably the correct choice, not to mention those who had been integral to the events which had come to pass, such as the word bearers. With every week and month since, Horus would come to ever more personal revelations as to how and why he was justified in every world they scoured, every statue that fell, every loyalist slaughtered. The slashing and burning of loyalist worlds would only reinforce the many ways by which the Emperor had betrayed and manipulated him, manipulated them all. But after some years into the heresy, Horus had begun to recall a strangeness, an emptiness in his memory. This was extremely strange. He a Primarch unable to recall. He had, as did they all, effectively a photographic memory. He remembered every moment of his life with perfect clarity and recall. Yet here, he came to realise that there was a blank period in his mind. A fragment of memory was all that remained. A world that was remote, seemingly of no strategic value whatsoever, yet he felt still important. Moloch stands as a world with significant relevance within the deeper history of the Imperium, a world visited by the Emperor and his traitorous son Horus Lupercal. It contained the mysterious warp portal that enabled the Emperor to steal fire, in the words of Malkador, from the Chaos Gods. During the Warmaster's voyage to Terra, the traitors left in their wake immense destruction. Scoured worlds lay in ruins, cities of billions raised by the forces of Horus, during the ongoing abhorrent wars of planetary annihilation, many of which continued long after his forces had left as they continued on to their final destination of Terra. The mysterious dark events of Moloch, though, were not its final chapter. The planet itself was one of the earliest believed colonised during humanity's initial expansion from Terra. Its galactic position in the current time remains somewhat unclear, it is situated in the galactic northeast from Terra, but could lie within the Ultima or Solar Segmentum. Due to the so called elliptical way, a region of space granting easy access to Segmentum Solar and fortress worlds of the outer systems. Moloch was a key world in controlling this pathway, but it also meant the planets of its system's orbit were difficult to reach from the warp. Moloch was a night world. During the Age of Strife, also known as Old Night, its environment had been apparently continually difficult for the colonists, and consequently it had become populated by night households who continued to maintain security for the world. After the Emperor's Crusade and its reabsorption into the Galactic Human Empire, Moloch was garrisoned, as was typical for planets newly returned to the fold. Usually this was to ensure their compliance as much as for their own protection. Many planets held populations who, while outwardly bending the knee, may not have been in fact too happy about being conquered. Always a risk that a world could descend into a conflict of resistance once the crusade had moved on. But unusually, Moloch was to be garrisoned especially heavily. Hundreds of Imperial Army regiments, even companies of Astartes from the 9th and 13th legions. For good measure, three contingent forces of Titan Legio, including an Imperator Titan, titled the Paragon of Terror. It was a truly incomprehensible weight of force for a fairly ordinary, strategically unimportant planet. 
Who, though, would dare to question the wisdom and will of the Emperor of Mankind, certainly not those among the ruling night houses, including its most powerful, Devin. The leaders presumed it was simply par for the course. None, of course, could have known that there were secretive reasons beyond maintaining basic imperial compliance. None would ever have had the presence of mind or inquisitive nature to spend time scouring through the planet's historical records, although had they done so, they may have come across small, ancient, damaged scraps of documentation. Most had been destroyed, but some survived. Archived, long censored, suggestions, references, which hinted to a being who could well have been the Emperor, having visited the world long ago, prior even to the unification of Terra. Still, their existence mattered not, for none would ever see such dangerously suggestive fragments, and even if they had, they wouldn't be able to comprehend or contextualize their relevance. Moloch itself had been a world ripe for colonization. Similar to the Earth in its size and orbit, this was undoubtedly the reason it was selected early on during the stellar exodus and humanity's earliest expansion. It held a lot of similarities geographically, four major continents covered its surface, each divided by warm, clear oceans and frozen poles. Two small remote regions of Estara and Europia were wilderness areas, home to hunters and miners. The more significant areas were that of Arcanius, an industrialized region and massive hive sprawl. Finally, its southern continent, Molokari, was the location of the Night Houses and Titan Legions. This continent covered the equatorial line of the planet, compromising mountainous regions, jungles, and agriculture, which centered around the capital of the surprisingly named Lupercalia. The strangely named capital of the world and its continent would be the primary region for the traitors to assault. It was seemingly a bizarre coincidence, if you believe in such things, that the capital city of Moloch shared its name with the War Master. More suspicious individuals could speculate as to how it came to own this name, perhaps from ancient previous visitors, and you would be correct in those suspicions. In fact, the Emperor was the reason the city existed here at all. Yet another fragment of the Emperor's ancient past comes to light. It's said that the Emperor set the city as its garrison long ago, and that the towering Dawn Citadel, which was the house of power for the capital, was in fact his ancient space vessel that came here long ago. But in the time that had passed, all memory of this fact had been lost. The Night Houses now ruled from the Citadel with no suspicion at all as to its past. Precisely how it came to hold its name is unknown. But again, creatively suspicious individuals could speculate that the Emperor, with his grand ability for foresight, may well have known the events that could come to pass, would come to pass, and that despite his best efforts, Horus would return to Moloch to gain the powers that would ultimately lead him to become the vessel of the four gods and his destiny to battle the Emperor above a boiling war of heresy below the Monterra. Now, to my mind, the question always remains. When the Emperor seemingly erased his son's memory of their having been on Moloch, did he do so knowing that it would not prevent them from returning in the future, or did he do so knowing that it could entice them to return? Did he do so in the vain hope that perhaps they may not return to this world? More to the question, if he had any suspicions about what the future held, why would he show anyone, including his loyal Primarchs at the time, the location of the portal on Moloch? For me, this is another red flag. There are decisions as seem to be very often scattered throughout the Emperor's history, where he seems to have made choices that are both unnecessary and complicate future matters. Had he not shown Horus this place previously, it's doubtful he ever would have been able to locate it, meaning the Emperor probably would have survived his battle with Horus, perhaps the outcome of the heresy would have been entirely different. Which makes you question, one, was the Emperor actually able to have any influence on future events? And moreover, was this all a plan of his own design in a very grand context? Despite some figures such as Malkador's complaints to the contrary, it just seems very often like the Emperor makes these choices which undoubtedly are going to lead to a very specific, relatively predictable outcome, which end up with him being on the Golden Throne for 10,000 years, worshipped by humanity. By the time Horus returned to Moloch, the city had become the largest upon the planet, 
a prosperous cultural centre and heavily defended Bastion. Without the context to make any more detailed assessment, the rulers of Moloch did not question why their world had been so heavily fortified at the behest of the Emperor himself. Like so many egotistical nobles of the Imperium, they likely qualified it as being their birthright and therefore entirely appropriate. While the Imperium maintains a strict process of standardization for its military hardware, and this is, of course, inextricably linked to the religion of the Mechanicus, there exist variations in performance and reliability for all weaponry and armor produced upon Forge Worlds. This is why some are better at producing plasma weapons, specific tanks, and so on. And this is why some vehicles are noted as being, say, riser pattern. Patterns refer to the specific small differences in the process of production upon a forge world, or sometimes where a pattern of STC exists specifically uniquely on a certain world. This is usually developed because of an STC that is more commonly available, but maybe was designed presumably by an original STC AI with a planet's requirements in mind. Either this, or the world has more securely maintained the integrity of the original STC plan, equating to more powerful hardware produced. While some Titan Legio were limited to existing only on a specific world, which often meant they were destroyed during the Heresy period, on other worlds which held significant power and extensive resources such as Forge World Riser, Legios could exert their influence to enable the expansion of their Titan legions. These would be sent out into the galaxy to become stationed on worlds across the fledgling Imperium, further increasing their legios' influence and favour within the Imperium. It's all politics. While these immense sentinels stood ready to face any threat, their deployment was also to ensure that by spreading themselves out across the Imperium, should any great darkness befall mankind once again, their legio would live on. But these differences in the quality of production, different hardware, applies to the Titan Legions just as much as it could to, say, basic equipment like a standard lasgun. Of course the production of a Titan is more complex, and it will be also dictated by strange techno rights, ancient machine traditions, and so on. And when we're dealing with the timescales involved, simply remembering information is not enough. Across 10,000 years or longer, it's inevitable that data will be lost, processes compromised, and this is one reason as to why the Mechanicus developed as it has in the first place, translating process, information, and schematics into religion, scripture, and dogma. Even then, across the void of time, accuracy has degraded. Worse, when some worlds would become corrupted and twisted by the schism in the Mechanicum during the Heresy, which is what of course resulted in the name shift to the Mechanicus, the Forge Worlds of the Traitors quickly would spiral into tech heresy, horrifying experimentation, often the blending of organic and machine, living humans tested, dismantled, integrated, used in an innumerable number of reprehensible ways. This was no different when it came to the Titans, Knights, Nobles and their Princeps. But in one example of the most well-known, venerated Titan Legions is Legio Crucius for they had long foreseen the possibility of galactic titan war. They had secretly taken the precaution of training themselves in titan-scale war games, and this meant some of their number taking the role of void shield breakers, while others would then bring down vulnerable god machines. This was a tactic they intended to deploy on Moloch, with a forward line of shield breakers supported by a more powerful line of ranged destroyers who would bombard any who came into the kill zone. One of the relevant aspects here is critical to Titanic Warfare, that is, their maniple structures, their formations. When Titan Legio fight, they rarely do so singularly. Titans don't just wander around a battlefield, they arrange themselves into small groups. And when knights do this, it's called a banner of knights. For Titans, it's a maniple. This is a formation of usually three titans, but it can be as many as six. The combination of specific titan classes, their loadouts will dictate their strategy. So you might, for example, have two Reavers supporting a Warlord Titan with three Warhounds as a secondary component. The Warhounds could harass and distract the enemy at the front, while the Reavers provide suppressing damaging fire also to protect the Warlord, whose role will be in delivering long-range bombardment and massive specific firepower that are execution shots. But it need not be this dynamic. You could, for example, have just three Warlord Titans, but they stay close together, overlapping Void Shields and their armor to become an almost invulnerable cluster 
that can withstand an immense level of firepower, relying on their own weaponry to just destroy and wither enemies before their shields can be broken, if at all. Three warlords continually maintaining each other's void shields and staying close together observationally is a very, very tough nut to crack. Some manipals though can also be very lightweight, a single reaver with two warhounds for example. It all depends on the specific situation and mission relevant factors. Horus and his allies held the collective clarity that the Emperor must fall. They knew that Terra would be their terminus, their ultimate destination, but the route by which to arrive held some dispute, and this was not a literal discussion of how to travel, more a priority of actions which should take place while on course to the homeworld of humanity. With the singular focus of the Crusade now a distant memory, traitor Astartes, Titan Legio, and Imperial commanders competed for the ear and the approval of Horus. Each attempted to crush the others with grandiose plans that would bring the final victory. Some called for a fast assault directly to Terra before those such as Dawn could fortify it. Others espoused their own desires to crush hated loyalists scattered throughout the galaxy before they could consolidate and reinforce the defences of the Emperor. Many more held wild, selfish, often irrelevant agendas of their own that were as fanciful as they were chaotic, often involving some opportunity or other to seek out revenge against enemies who had wronged them at some time. To little surprise, Horus blankly ignored all of these requests, including those even from his fellow Primarchs Mortarian and Fulgrim. The voices in his head had become ever clearer, and he knew now that he needed more power. Despite his demigod status as a Primarch, this alone would not be enough to vanquish the false Emperor of Mankind. Horus's continued frustration at his previously mentioned realisation now of memory absence troubled him. Why could he not remember? He rationalised that it could only be because of the Emperor. Only he had the power and knowledge to have manipulated his mind in this way, but why? This was further concentrated by his own dark dreams and voices. He believed that it were now critical for him to find the secret that the Emperor had seemingly hidden from him. It surely must be, if not a weapon, then some other knowledge or power that he could turn upon the Master of Mankind. And so, acquiescing to the vision of their War Master, the traitor fleets set out for Moloch. In the void around Moloch, more than 60 Loyalist vessels of the Emperor's battle fleet including at least eight massive capital ships, waited. Behind this lay a vast orbital defence net hung in high orbit of the planet, its rows of cannon and torpedo batteries ready to see off any invaders strong and bold enough to penetrate the fleet's defensive line. The Imperial Admiral had a straightforward enough and seemingly robust plan to lure the traitors close to the planet so they could engage in one massive orbital battle, utilising the powerful defence net around the planet, thereby ensuring victory. It was a flawless plan, but one that was so obvious it should have been plain that a master strategist such as Horus Lupercal would not fall for something that any child of an Imperial world would have been able to see. Horus had sent ahead of his own fleet powered down, slowly drifting ships, dark to the senses of the Loyalists, and slowly these had been creeping in stealth toward the vessels of the Emperor. Within these dark ships lay many thousands of Astartes of the Sons of Horus, while the Loyalists continued to keep their gaze upon the approaching traitor fleet. As Horus's stealth attack against the orbital arrays began to unfold, it was already too late. The defenders were panicking and surrounded, an approaching traitor fleet of the War Master was coming, and close quarter engagements were breaking out all around them. It was a slaughter. The populace from the ground below could see all too clearly the skies above them were visually ablaze. Yet even then it seemed somehow unreal. War? Coming to Moloch? The citizenry could not believe it, but that delusion was shattered not long after, as the burning debris of loyalist ships began to finally make planetfall. Fear and panic gripped the citizenry of the world as the undeniable reality struck them. The War Master was now ready to assault the planet of Moloch. The Loyalists were immediately baffled by the landing site chosen by the traitors, a worthless island in the far north of the planet. Worse still, it could only reach the main landmasses via a narrow causeway. This was the Warmaster's plan? 
it was troubling for the defenders who were fast entrenching their positions. The knights of Moloch were overflowing with a restless, bristling energy and a lust for glory. They charged head on into the still deploying traitor Astartes and the sons of Horus, thereby they thought to catch them off guard. They were led by the planetary governor of the most powerful knight house, Divin, Lord Raven, who incidentally sometime previous whilst hunting in his knight household with his own knight Bane Lash kicked his father Cyprian, still in his knight suit, down into a deep chasm, murdering him and taking his place as imperial governor of Moloch. Now this might be relevant later. Raven, along with his sons, now met the invaders. They sought out the Warmaster, and astonishingly, it were yet another instance where Horus himself came close to death. In fact, saved only by the strange powers of the four who stood behind him, imbuing him with their ethereal powers. Although Lord Raven escaped with his life, the knights who fought with him were quickly put down, including two of his three sons. The fast-shifting brutality of the 16th Legion was on plain display. Soon after, the Imperial defenders would face the same and nothing less than total obliteration by an onslaught from the most relentless warriors in the galaxy. The landing zones were cleared and prepared, Titanfall immediately initiated. Four Titan legions of the traitors would be brought to bear on Moloch, the true gods of war, ancient engines from before the age of unification, the literal destroyers of worlds. All Titans are fearful enemies, but the names of Legio, Mortis, Volcanum and Volpa the truly titles to send a stomach-turning shiver of dread through mortal men. Legio Interfector joined them also. Their manipuls immediately began their long march, breaking out from their deployment frames. Their orders were simple and typical. Lay waste to your nearest enemy targets. For Moloch, this meant the large urban centres. But as was typical of the titanic wars of the heresy, they would not be allowed free reign. Facing them down, were the titans of Legio Fortidus, refugee titans from the adjacent simultaneous Mechanicum civil war who, while very outnumbered, would make their stand. The god machines battled over a city that had quickly emptied out of its citizenry who now made their own way towards safer refuge. Their homes burned the city ablaze, a firestorm. The very rock of the structures, statues and citadels melted under the initial ferocity of titanic weaponry. The collapse of the loyalist titans of Legio Fortidus was unfortunately inevitable, but they had sold themselves at a costly price to the traitors who were bloodied more than they had anticipated from such a paltry initial contact. If it were any consolation to the princeps of Legio Fortidus, they had given the citizenry enough time to reach something of a safe distance, for now. The reasoning though, as to Horus's deployment so far away from seemingly any specific site, continued to elude the loyalists. And well it might, for it had no rational basis in military strategy, which was of course not anything that one would have expected from the Warmaster. His reasoning to begin the invasion of Moloch here on a remote, unimportant island causeway was very simple. He sought to retrace his steps from his shattered memory. Legends told that this was known as the Fulgurin Path, and had been walked by the Emperor himself long ago. With his initial deployment successful, Horus continued on this pilgrimage, with his sights now firmly set upon Lupercalia. Meanwhile, other elements of his fleet were also deploying to the world. Mortarion and his Death Guard fell upon the city of Ophir to the planetary east. The legendary, unstoppable force of the 15th Legion was on full display, and the city fell into a burning ruin with little to show for it. Backed by the powerful Titan Manipals from again the traitor Legio, the battle was over before it truly began. None were spared, civilian and military targets seemingly bore no distinction. While tragic, the fall of Ophir was again not tactically devastating. In fact, the 15th had landed so far from Lupercalia, they had a great distance to travel so as to support Horus. This was only made worse by the extremely dense, near impenetrable jungle forest that spanned the area between the two cities. It did, however, force the defenders of Lupercalia to man their eastern defence line, which was usually only crewed by a small monitoring force, designed to repel dangerous creatures from the green hell in the east. Few of the commanders believed the Astartes assaulting Ophir would actually traverse the natural obstruction, having patrolled it themselves and seen firsthand the extreme difficulty in doing so, the slow speed required to navigate it. They were soon to be proven horribly wrong. 
The Astartes they now faced were not the Legion warriors that were once the glory and might of the Emperor's Crusade, which would have been bad enough. These were the twisted monsters distorted by the power of the warp which now touched upon them. They could withstand weaponry that would have previously torn them apart. The Death Guard would unleash the Life Eater virus upon the jungle forests of Moloch. In an extreme enough quantity, this is the weapon of Exterminatus. In a reduced quantity, it was still able to devour entire hive cities of organic life and clear continents of flora and fauna. Through the blackened sludge mire of organic material, the Death Guard and their titanic support trudged relentlessly forward. Worse still, the unleashing of such a deadly bioweapon pushed the extremely hostile native lifeforms to flee in the opposite direction. The defensive line of Lupercalia forced to now engage in a tsunami of Xenos forms ahead of the traitors. The defenders were only cutting swaths through the mindless alien forms, but it was not enough. They were overwhelmed, and by the time the largely untouched forces of Death Guard and Titan allies approached Lupercalia to the east, the defences were in many places destroyed and broken, largely in disarray, not to mention the volume of material firepower that had been wasted. The loyalist knights of House Don R charged out to do whatever they could, but it was merely a token gesture, a last stand of honour and duty when no other practical alternative was available. The now fully deployed marching army of Horus steadily approached the city from the opposite direction. They consumed all areas they passed through, small cities, agri-productions were raised, civilians slaughtered like animals. It was steady, relentless, methodical, and a perfect demonstration of the traitor's appalling turn away from the Emperor's teachings. Although, I think one might argue, their actions here were not such a wide step away from the many campaigns carried out under the banner of the Emperor during the Great Crusade. Loyalists embedded themselves within the now fortified cities of the Western Marches, and set ambushes where possible throughout the agricultural plains. Some of the great knight houses of Moloch would participate eager to strike titans constrained by claustrophobic urban environments and columns of armour that they could seize upon from the external city ruins. Around this time, Albard Devin, the former murdered Lord Cyprian Devin's firstborn son, had been crippled by a failed pairing with a night spirit. Since that time for the past 40 years, he had been imprisoned and drugged by his sadistic half-siblings, such are the typical affairs of Imperial nobility. Yet, he somehow manages to now regain a scrap of sanity and abruptly murders his stepmother Sibella when she comes to drain his blood for the depraved rituals of this so-called serpent cult. This was a strange forbidden cult to which many of Moloch's nobility had been secretly enthralled. Albard uses Sibella's exosuit to bolster his wasted body, and he sets out for revenge upon Raven. Meanwhile, as the perimeter skirmishes continue, knight banners of House Indra and Kolshik were aided by the warhounds of Legio Crucius, who launched assaults against several manipoles of Legio Volcanum and Volpa. The city was now a literal foundry of death and engine war, the streets and spires ablaze, streets littered with the molten slag remains of fallen lords of war. God machines stumbled through buildings and came crashing to the ground as their princeps or movement systems became critically damaged. Others' reactors would overload, sucking the air into a vacuum implosion before vaporizing or liquefying raw materials surrounding it, be that titan or structure alike. Close quarter titanicus warfare such as this inevitably becomes a white hot burning crucible of destruction, and the western region of Moloch was to be no different. While the Imperial defenders and civilians were crushed with little resistance, it was amid this burning agricultural wasteland that traitors were contested by the knights and titans of the loyalists. The dystopian hellscapes now scoured of anything that once resembled civilization. Knights of House Mamorogon, aided by Legio Graphonicus, assailed those of Mortis and the Sons of Horus, who were methodically deconstructing Imperial fortifications, but despite the loyalists' valiant efforts, they could not stand. At the same time to the east, the Death Guard continued their typical, unrelenting march as they would enter the city of Imperatum, engaging in a methodical cleansing of despairing slaughter against any who opposed them. Moloch had suffered severely, but there could be no surrender, no mercy, no choice other than to resist to the last, to stand against the darkness and sell their souls at the highest price. Besides which, for the Loyalists, and sadly unbeknownst to many of the Guard forces who are obliterated so far by the monstrous Astartes, all of this 
had merely been a delaying tactic to slow the enemy and bleed them. It would be at the capital itself that the Princeps Magnus of Legio Graphonicus and Crucius had decreed they would shatter the traitor titans, using the world-ending weaponry of that most incomprehensible of god engines, the Imperator Scale Titan Paragon of Terror, in a final engagement of concentrated titanic obliteration. Let the War Master come and loose his weapons against our plasteel skins and ceramic hearts. See what glory it gets him. We are the children of the Machine God. What is he? A spoiled son, a damned traitor to his people. The battle for Moloch was already a raging cauldron of terror, vengeance and bitterness. Many loyalists may well have been accurately described as simply too angry to die, and they had fought hard and well. The enemy were dealt some severe blows. Plus, they knew they still had cards left to play. In addition to the Imperator, there were still the companies of the 9th and 13th legions heavily dug in, ready to resist all that could be thrown against them. Teana Kurian was the Lord General of the Grand Army of Moloch, and along with the Knights Titans and Astartes, this would be their final battle, the last stand. The Imperial Army had many hundreds of regiments remaining, companies of armour and super heavy titan killers, most had been entrenched around the city. Raven Devon had taken charge of the massive military come refugee camp that had become established on the outskirts of Lupercalia, but he's informed of some sign related to this troubling serpent cult waiting for him in the nearby woods. And this turns out to be none other than Fulgrim himself masquerading as the Naga of this serpent cult. He tempts Raven with the pleasures and power of Slanesh. But Raven has enough will to resist and even attacks Fulgrim before fleeing. He returns to the camp but collapses from the exertion and apparently is also poisoned. As he awakens to unfortunately find Albard Devin holding him prisoner. Albard admits to killing Raven's last surviving son and then tortures him to death. The extremely disturbed and compromised Albard now takes command of House Devin. His sanity and remaining willpower is on the edge of collapse. The dark forces await this moment eagerly, ready to catch what's left of him. For all their impressive preparations, the Imperial Army was dwarfed and seemed almost a token gesture compared to the Titan Legio that had amassed. The Warlords, Reavers and Warhounds of Legio Graphonicus formed an orbital formation to bolster the power of the Resistance. Within that great citadel of Moloch, the Iron Fist Mountain, the Knights of House Devin, the Titans of the Legio Crucius, waited for war. Others had already taken to the field, but by far the keystone of their defence was the vast Imperator Titan, Paragon of Terror. As it stood astride the city gates, the great god engine's guns covered the approaches to Lupercalia, its crew so confident that none could survive the wrath of the Imperator. Imperators are in fact a class of the largest Imperial Titan designation known as an Emperor, the other class being the Warmonger. Their sheer size makes them extremely rare to even be seen in warfare. Their scale makes them both difficult to deploy and in some regards to engage enemy. Their most notable features are the large gothic crenellated cathedral structure built atop its shoulders. They also feature arched openings within their lower legs from which entire infantry armies can stream out from midway through combat to repel borders against close range enemies. In the ancient period of the early Imperium, Titan Legio may have fielded between two and four Emperor class Titans. Numbers in the modern Imperium may vary and are difficult to account for, but they're certainly a very rare class only deployed in the most severe of circumstances. Again, not least because actually getting them to the battlefield is something in and of itself. The Imperator class primarily field a Hellstorm cannon and plasma annihilator. As with most Imperial weapons, these are essentially scaled up versions of existing tech. The Hellstorm being a multi-barrel energy weapon not dissimilar to a Warlord macro gatling blaster and its smaller variants seen on Reavers. Its devastating power can carve through mountains, strip all void shields from a Warlord Titan with a single volley. The Plasma Annihilator is even more straightforward. 
It's one of the largest, if not the largest, plasma weapons in the Imperial Arsenal. It's an insane weapon that effectively fires miniature stars or suns at its enemies, vaporising anything it comes into contact with on impact, forming craters hundreds of metres wide. As with many titanic weapons, firing it alone can be problematic even for allies. The shockwave and sound emitted so powerful they can cause damage to structure, and for any unprotected human infantry directly below, like a guardsman, the shockwave can break bones, even pulp human flesh, the heat can burn away skin. Thus, the Imperator is often seen deployed only during a full Legio assault upon an enemy city, or as was the case for Lupercalia, a stationary defensive weapons platform. Any friendly forces nearby were cleared from its immediate area or heavily dug in and protected. So Lupercalia did appear to be unassailable, even despite the collapse of the Eastern Preceptor line. The Sons of Horus and Death Guard companies seemed outmatched, a fact the Traitor Legio seemed well aware of. It might have been too strong to say that they feared to face down the Imperator, but they certainly were aware of the consequences should they attempt to do so, namely their Titan manipuls being turned to liquid slag kilometres before they could even breach the city walls. And even if they were to do so, Legio Crucius had Titan reserves beneath the Iron Fist Mountain, meaning after a brutal assault to the city's edge, their battered engines would face fresh loyalist Titans with their shields and reactors operating at optimal levels, which translates to the Traitor Titans' void shields and reactors being pushed to the limit, likely collapsing as the Loyalists overpower their weaponry and incinerate the Traitors. Despite all this, the Warmaster approached the city with no apparent concerns for what they were facing. While the heresy is always thought of in terms of the legions turning against one another, the Traitors fielded just as strong mortal armies as those of the Loyalists, and so the vast hordes of traitor guard threw themselves against the defences of the capital city. And were this an ordinary battle, their sheer numbers may have prevailed, but against the carefully deployed multi-legio Titanicus defence line, they were slaughtered, turned to ashes, boiling pools of organic matter, or simply completely vaporised. Meanwhile, the Warmaster sent his Sons of Horus companies against the Iron Fist Mountain. They pounded it as they flew low from their Thunderhawks and Storm Eagles, they picked shots against the outer defences, and were countered by the carefully embedded companies of Ultramarines, who had, at least in this instance, surmised that a surprise assault could potentially penetrate the fortress and attack Legio Crucius Titan reserves before they reached the field, a sound tactical score for the 13th Legion. Or at least, this was how it appeared. Unfortunately, the Sons of Horus were only assaulting the mountain to hold the Ultramarines in place for what was still to come. The catastrophic orbital defence of Moloch that had collapsed so pitifully under a quite straightforward stealth assault by the Warmaster's fleet meant that the combat had been fierce and brief. However, it also meant that the traitors were able to seize ships and defensive systems from the Loyalists still intact, as the Sons of Horus held the 13th and Titan reserves within the Iron Fist Mountain they were coordinating with forces in orbit, who were dragging an orbital defence platform into position above the capital city. Orbital bombardments using macro cannonade or lances are generally not used during ground campaigns, and while this may seem an obvious tool to use in destroying your enemies, firstly it relies upon having the capability to deploy such weaponry, and secondly, targeting moving enemy positions or even stationary targets on the ground requires complex calculations, and stray shots could prove very deadly to friendly forces or to valuable resources, infrastructure, and so on. This was not the case for the target desired by Horus in the battle for Moloch and Lupercalia. Their target was a mountain, a very forgiving target for slight positioning errors, and no friendly forces were nearby. As the first light barrage hit the mountain rock, it was stripped in seconds. Megatons of explosive power shattered through the remaining strata. The titans within crushed as their bunkers and storage halls collapsed. In the aftermath, only remnants of the Legio Crucius remained, dragging their battered, broken remains from the devastation. They sighted their end approaching. Traitor Titans bearing down, breaking through the annihilated landscape, followed by the Sons of Horus scouring the landscape for survivors. Those on the front lines could see in the distance the destruction of their protected flank, 
they could not disengage from the hordes of dark Mechanicum Scitarii constructs they were engaged with, but they also were now well aware they had nowhere to fall back to, and that in all likelihood they would soon face enemies on two fronts, undermining their solid defensive plans. The surviving titans of Crucius, who had emerged from the destruction of the mountain, positioned themselves ready to engage Legia Mortis and Volcanum through the burning remains of a geographical landmark. Warhounds and Reavers dueled and continued to launch devastating missile and energy weapon strikes, some throwing themselves into vicious close quarter engagements, dragging their enemies down in last ditch efforts to inflict damage. They needed support but the front lines were too heavily engaged to spare any titans from either Crucius or Griffonicus. Still, without enemy titans to oppose them at the front, they stopped any approaching heavy war machines long before they could reach the city. And while the loyalist infantry and armor engaged their hostile equivalents, the super heavies of the Imperial Army's command made their presence known, blasting apart spearheads of enemy tanks, their heavily fortified bunker networks cut down any in range. At around this time, the contingent of 9th Legion Blood Angels would make a final charge into the heart of the Traitor Lines, seeking death in battle to atone for succumbing to the Red Thirst whilst on patrol months previous, having massacred a company of guardsmen. Horus will deploy the Red Angel to sway the Blood Angels to chaos, but they instead choose death rather than allowing themselves to be twisted and corrupted by the traitors. Many of the higher grade defenders were troubled by how the battle for their city was playing out, not least the Lords of the Night Households, who were forced to sit back with their night banners being held as reserves. Lord Albad of the leading powerhouse Devin felt this all too keenly, or so it appeared, for he was by now a deeply broken man. His mind crumbled and in its place something else stirred within him, and by extension, House Devin. Devin had risen to power in the shadow of the former High King's death. Many night houses upon Imperial worlds jostle to be the most powerful, the line to which all others look, not dissimilarly to how Imperial nobles will vie for power within the high spires of an Imperial city or capital world of a system. Most of the time this is little more than internal politics, seat swapping and name changing that does little to alter the actual stability or flow of things. The Imperium itself only takes notice when this breaks out into dangerous rivalries, sabotage, assassinations, destabilization that could lead to a civil conflict, perhaps even hive war upon a world. So House Devin long saw themselves as first among their fellow knight households, and as the proverbial goes, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Their desire to be the most senior meant, although not directly twisted as Lord Albed had become, they were nonetheless subconsciously primed for corruption. The arrival to Moloch of the Primarch Fulgrim meant that what was to come was now surely inevitable. Remembering that much like Titans, Night Spirits are a two-way street with their pilots, and so as the machines will instill past memories and knightly values, they themselves are also imbued with the thoughts, feelings and perhaps soul of their noble pilots, the machines themselves susceptible to the corruption after years of internalized paranoia, jealousy, lusting for power from their pilots. Lord Albard of House Devin had been so tormented by these strange visions, mental projections of Fulgrim, seeing the Primarch as the emissary of Slanesh, the corruption of both he and his knight armor would follow. The consequences of this, apocalyptic. Albard, now operating under lucid delusions that he is the Emperor on his first conquest of Moloch, he is under the spell of the chaos energies left inside his knight from Raven Devin's encounter with Fulgrim. His orders are to engage Horus's reserve forces, but instead, Albert leads his knights in attacking the Imperator Titan. The twisted knights of House Devin came seemingly out of nowhere. The Imperator Paragon of Terror had no warning nor expectation to be suddenly assaulted to its weakly defended rear. Its princeps and immediate defences caught completely off guard, the knights with their thermal lances concentrating their fire, they assaulted from within the void shields of the massive war machine. This being one of the core weaknesses of titans, and this is why knights can be devastating to a titan should they close the distance to enter the radius of void shields, remembering the voids only protect against ranged projectile and energy weaponry. Once an enemy is within close quarters, void shields are effectively redundant. 
and many a titan has been felled by a ravenous banner of knights carving and stabbing them to the ground in a grisly scene reminiscent of a Caesar's fall. The scene which played out at the gates to Lupercalia, far more vicious. The knights lanced and stabbed, focusing entirely on the casing of its plasma reactors. Before there really could be any defence to this abhorrent assault, the consequences became horrifically apparent. Their high energy beam weapons stripped the protective layers around the core, exposing the immense unstable plasma energy at the core of the Emperor Titan. The knights had moments to clear the area before what looked like the birth of a new sun would appear amid the loyalist lines. All who looked upon this were instantly blinded, but their pain would only last moments before a truly massive blast wave was cast in all directions. The extreme levels of unstable energy were unleashed, all those caught in the path were vaporised, reduced to ash or liquefied, infantry, armour, even other titans were consumed, their void shields lasting mere seconds before collapsing, the armoured shells crushed like paper cups. This would be the beginning of the end for Lupercalia and hailed the doom of Moloch. Horus now unleashed his forces proper. There were no guardrails from here on. The Death Guard Legio Mortis fought through the defenders. Any remaining titans from the mountain were being pushed into tight avenues of the city, and there they found the traitors of House Devin, who butchered them. For any remaining loyalists within Lupercalia, it was now a battle that resembled little more than every man for themselves. Discipline, order and strategy had collapsed. Horus and his personal force were calmly headed towards his goal of the hidden warp gate deep below the ruined surface of his namesake city. Horus of course would reach his ultimate goal, slaughtering the few remaining guardians left by the Emperor. He emerges mere moments later in the eyes of the sons of Horus. But for the War Master, it has been many years, and he now is empowered as his final form. Thus, Horus will soon face his father whilst orbiting Terra, where both will meet their ultimate destinies. Horus paid little attention to the continuing situation now on Moloch. It was a broken, irrelevant world. He returned to the fleet with the Sons of Horus Legion and a significant contingent of the ground forces. Even as the War Master's fleet began to depart, the traitor guards still standing had been abandoned, but many were so deep in combat they were largely unaware, and would continue to pour their rage upon Lupercalia. Their steady progress would result in the planet becoming completely subjugated to the traitor's dark compliance. Some titans remained also to ensure the final stages of the world's domination went without significant resistance, sometimes encountering surviving loyalist titans as they steadily decimated cities and fortresses. The last ugly chapter for Moloch, though, would come via the twisted minds of House Devin. Led by the corrupted knight armor Bane Nash and its token pilot now, the traitor knights hunted down any remaining knight houses of Moloch, exterminating all who would not swear allegiance to the War Master. It was a great testament to the integrity of those who remained that not a single knight household is believed to have sided with House Devin. As the blazing cities cooled, the pitiful survivors awoke in the ashes of the formerly quite beautiful planet, only to face a new struggle for existence, their lives governed by cruel traitor garrisons, a meaningless remnant of humanity scratching a living upon a now effectively dead world. While in many ways a straightforward campaign assault and domination of a loyalist world, Moloch was an especially noteworthy campaign featuring devastating titanic warfare, Key to its place in the heresy was, of course, Horus's ascension to become a newly empowered champion of the Dark Gods, a corruption that would in time turn traitor legios into armies of demonic engines, just as had been seen in House Devin. In the fullness of time, Moloch would be liberated by the Imperium in the aftermath of the Siege of Terror, but this was very little to be celebrating. Its ruined cities and landscape would never be the same, nor could they fully erase the memories of the events that took place. The shame and the horror embedded in the cultural consciousness of the citizenry, Horus's forces had cut deep to the heart of Moloch. And even by M41, the stain of betrayal cannot be cleansed. <laughs>